Drake Bell recently revealed heart-wrenching insight into the horrific abuse he experienced as a child actor in the Quiet On Set documentary. Naturally, people came to his social media to express their deepest condolences and uplift him with positive support. He is now receiving millions of views on his posts, seeing a massive uptick in music streams, and even strategically entering new business endeavors after the boost in support from the documentary. However, just a few years ago, Drake was shunned by the entirety of social media. He was called a depraved predator after being found guilty for disseminating matter harmful to a juvenile. Most people wrote him off as a pedophile after these crimes came to light, but now after him detailing his own abuse, we have much more context and nuance to consider during Drake Bell's complicated comeback. Now it's important to understand the information that Drake revealed during the Quiet On Set documentary first, as these unfortunate events did occur when Drake was just a child. This information just came to light a little over a month ago. Drake Bell formed a bond with dialogue coach Brian Peck during the second season of The Amanda Show. Peck, who has no relation to Drake's co-star Josh Peck, would invite Drake to his house for acting lessons. These lessons were supervised by Drake's father, Joe, who was told that Brian Peck was a skilled coach who could help Drake secure more acting opportunities. However, over time, Joe became uncomfortable with their relationship. And unfortunately, I started seeing Brian start to just hang around Drake too much. And it didn't, didn't set well with me. Drake would be in the dressing room or something, and in would pop Brian and um, just touch Drake. You know, do things that, wait a second, what are you doing? Drake can put that on himself. And the thing is, this is in front of people. Joe claims that while his son was in the dressing room, Brian would touch Drake in front of others in ways that made him question Brian's intentions. Joe expressed his concerns with the production personnel and said he was uncomfortable with Brian, only to be called homophobic because of Brian's sexual orientation. Therefore, Joe backed off. Once this got back to Brian, he manipulated Drake into severing ties with his father slash manager, suggesting that Joe was sabotaging Drake's career. Peck subsequently integrated himself into multiple areas of Bell's life and became a father figure for the young actor. Eventually, Peck convinces Drake's mother to let him stay at his house during auditions. Then when Drake slept on Brian's couch, the sexual assault started. I was sleeping on the couch where I would usually sleep and I woke up to him. I, I just opened my eyes, I woke up and he was, uh, he was sexually assaulting me. Um, why don't you think of the worst stuff that someone can do to somebody as a sexual assault? And that'll answer your question. Drake wouldn't tell anyone for several months. The abuse persisted until Drake began spending more time at a girlfriend's house. One day, when he was supposed to meet with Brian, Drake said he didn't want to hang out. Brian then started calling his phone nonstop. When Drake failed to answer, Brian obsessively started calling his girlfriend's house, which is when the girlfriend's mother suspected something was wrong and took Drake to her family therapist. He later detailed the abuse to his own mother, who called the police. I had to be excruciatingly detailed about every single thing and time that it had happened with two absolute strangers. The worst part was I had to make a phone call to Brian and get him to admit what he'd done. The police monitored a wired phone call with Brian, who broke into a full-on confession that led to his arrest. The investigation was conducted privately, and Bell remained unidentified to the public for several years due to his age at the time. During Brian Peck's trial, numerous prominent figures in the entertainment industry wrote letters of support vouching for his character. Many of them were people that Drake trusted and respected. Brian Peck was convicted of child molestation in 2004, pleading no contest to a charge of oral copulation with a minor under 16 and a charge of performing a lewd act with a 14 or 15 year old. He spent only 16 months in prison and was mandated to register as a sex offender, a mere slap on the wrist for such a horrible crime. But Drake remained strong and would go on to star in his own buddy comedy sitcom Drake and Josh, which is what all of us know and love him for today. After the show ended in 2006, Drake Bell seemed to disappear from the spotlight, and that's partially due to the terrible car accident that Drake was in that almost cost him his life. I know if I suffered injuries that bad, I would be searching for a good lawyer. Your injury could be worth millions, and Morgan & Morgan doesn't settle for any lowballs. In the past couple of months, they saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, 34 times the highest insurance offer, $26 million in Philadelphia, 40 times the highest offer, $6.8 million in New York, 25 times the highest offer. All law firms are not the same. Morgan & Morgan are the biggest for a reason. They've won. 
a lot. They have over 4,000 support staff to help you with your case at any time. The best part is their fee is absolutely free unless you win. You can submit a claim with America's largest injury law firm in just one click. Submit your claim now with Morgan & Morgan at www.forthepeople.com Patrick or click the link in the description. Trey received very consistent work over the years doing voice acting roles in shorts, TV shows, and movies. His most notable role was Peter Parker in Marvel's Ultimate Spider-Man animated series. When he wasn't doing voiceovers, he was writing and releasing his own music. Interestingly enough, his records weren't very popular in the United States, but were huge in various Spanish-speaking countries. The Drake and Josh Nickelodeon show was extremely popular in Latin countries, likely due to the excellent job the production team did with dubbing the actors' voices. Drake always wanted to be a rock star, ever since his earliest days on The Amanda Show in 2001. He released music consistently for 17 years but received no gold or platinum records in America. However, in Mexico and other various Spanish-speaking countries, Drake Bell, aka Drake Campana, had multiple high-charting Billboard singles and albums. In some of these countries, he performed shows for thousands of people. He learned to speak Spanish. He has written and released a ton of music in Spanish. He even provides Spanish subtitles with every podcast or social media post he makes. People have joked on social media Media that he ran away to Mexico to avoid charges of his 2020 crimes, when in reality he was more successful there for over a decade and probably made most of his income in Latin-speaking countries. But over the years, we slowly saw Drake's life unravel a bit. In 2010, Drake was charged with driving under the influence. He was subsequently released on a $20,000 bond and pleaded not guilty. In 2014, he filed for bankruptcy after owing the IRS over half a million dollars in taxes. The next year, police officers in Glendale, Los Angeles noticed Drake's car drifting lanes at an unsafe speed. The officers pulled Bell over and reported him smelling of alcohol before conducting a field sobriety test, which he failed. They promptly arrested him under suspicion of driving under the influence. Bell decided to plead guilty and was sentenced to four days in jail and four years probation, and he would be required to attend an alcohol education program. He only served one day in jail for good behavior. The following year, he posted two tweets about he was not invited to Josh Peck's wedding, which sent the media into a frenzy speculating that Drake and Josh had some sort of falling out. But a couple months later, they reassured everyone that there was no bad blood between them and they even did some YouTube content together. In 2018 and 2019, they made a number of different content pieces together that secured millions of views. It really seemed like their relationship was as good as it can get. But you should know that today, all of these videos have been deleted from Josh's YouTube channel. And that happened roughly around the time Drake was was outed by his abuser for allegedly sexually pursuing underage girls. In August of 2020, Drake's former girlfriend, Melissa Lingafelt, who goes by the stage name Jimmy Ono on social media, posted a TikTok that jeopardized Bell's clean reputation. Melissa claimed that Drake committed both verbal and physical abuse during their relationship from August 2006 to February 2009. When I started dating Drake, I was 16. I was homeschooled. I moved in with him. I was singing. It wasn't until about a year when the verbal abuse started. And when I say verbal abuse, imagine the worst type of verbal abuse you could ever imagine. And that was what I got. Um, it then turned into physical, hitting, throwing, everything. Um, at the pinnacle of it, he drug me down the stairs of our house in Los Feliz. My face hit every step on the way down. Um, I have photos of this. <laughs> I don't even want to get into the underage girls thing. I mean, I will, but I'm scared. As if the allegations of physical abuse weren't shocking enough, Melissa hinting that he was somehow involved with underage girls set the internet on fire. Drake vehemently denied ever abusing Melissa. As our relationship ended more than a decade ago, we unfortunately both called each other terrible names, as often happens when couples are breaking up, but that is it. Clearly, Melissa still felt close enough to me just last year that she was comfortable reaching out to ask me to provide her with financial support during a tough time, which I did. The public opinion on the situation was split. While many people reacted with empathy and support towards Melissa, recognizing the seriousness of domestic abuse, others were skeptical and expressed doubt about her claims, especially since Melissa failed to provide any concrete evidence against Drake. Plus, Drake made it seem like she was doing this expose for money, casting doubt on her intentions. It was purely a he said she said situation and Drake wouldn't face any legal consequences. Melissa, after spending weeks talking about the situation online, deleted all her videos and detached herself from the situation. But it only took a few months for more serious allegations to come to light and Drake's reputation to be permanently destroyed. 
On June 4th, 2021, Bell was arrested in Cleveland, Ohio on charges relating to attempted endangering of children and disseminating matter harmful to juveniles. For context, child endangerment occurs whenever a parent, guardian, or other adult caregiver allows a child to be placed or remain in a dangerous, unhealthy, or inappropriate situation. Disseminating matter harmful to juveniles means that a person has unlawfully ordered, offered, sold, displayed, or given graphic or obscene material such as books, videos, messages, Messages, photos, etc., to someone under the age of 18. To simplify, he was being charged of sexting a minor. However, the nature of the charges say that there was no sexual contact. According to the court documents, the date of the offense was December 1st, 2017. Bell was going to Cleveland, Ohio's The Odeon to perform a concert. Bell then seemingly invited the minor to his show in Cleveland. In the months leading up to the concert, Drake sent the victim inappropriate social media messages. The minor, who lived in Canada, attended Bell's concert in Cleveland. Cleveland. She and Bell met later that night at the Cleveland nightclub on Old River Road in the city's east bank of the Flats District. In October 2018, 10 months after the incident, the 15-year-old victim filed a report with her local police department in Canada regarding what had happened that night. This is all the information that was revealed in the case. So naturally, people were confused as this was all extremely vague. Even news outlets were unable to discern what actually happened. Disseminating matter harmful to children. Uh, we don't have information on exactly what that is, but you can imagine uh, a relationship between a 15-year-old girl and a 34-year-old uh, man uh, will you let you draw your own conclusion. Then his ex, Melissa, who accused him of abuse on TikTok one year prior, did an exclusive interview with the Daily Beast where she claimed that she observed Bell's inappropriate behavior with minors firsthand. What he's being arrested for right now is a prime example of what I would witness, him having inappropriate conversations online with underage girls. Melissa said, I saw really questionable crazy stuff on his computer. The stuff he'd be looking at was effing insane. These statements combined with the extremely vague court case details fueled the narrative that Drake was a pet. Now, it's important to consider that as soon as the victim reported Drake in October of 2018, Canadian authorities and Cleveland authorities promptly started an investigation. This investigation lasted 18 months, gathering all the evidence, photos, screenshots, and multiple statements from the victim to build a case against Bell. They even gained access to Drake's Instagram, Snapchat, laptops, everything they could. We don't technically know what they found, but whatever it was was enough to cause Drake to enter a plea deal instead of going to trial. And on June 23rd, 2021, he pled guilty to attempted child endangerment. So remember, all the details regarding his case were extremely vague, and then on top of that, he pleads guilty. So now everyone in the public is just extra convinced that he is a pet but it somehow got even worse. Drake's sentencing was conducted over Zoom and then posted on YouTube. During this sentencing, the victim made an impact statement, which is essentially their opportunity to talk directly to the defendant and the judge to express their thoughts and emotions about the crime. This was the very first time anyone had heard the details of the alleged crimes that took place. But during the impact statement, the victim brought up countless new allegations and statements that were never presented during the investigation, which shocked Drake, the defense, and even the judge. Remember, Drake was already pleading guilty to basically sexting, but since he was pleading guilty, the public assumed that everything the victim was saying here was part of the case, but it was not. I started off as a fan of him. Everyone who knew me as a child knew that he was a hero to me. I would have done anything for him. When I was 11, I learned that my aunt had a mutual friend who knew the defendant. That led to my aunt taking me to meet him for the first time in 2014 when I was 12. From the time I was 12 to 15, my aunt took me to meet him and spend time with him many times. After I met him for the first time, he started speaking to me more frequently online. When I was 13, I went to him for boy advice. He told me that I was beautiful and that boys were stupid. He then sent me a photo of myself that he had screen capped from my Instagram telling me that I was, quote, such a cutie. He saved that photo of me onto his phone. Another instance of creepy behavior happened when I was spending time with him at the age of 14. He told me that he couldn't believe how much I'd grown since he last saw me. He said that I wasn't little anymore and I was, quote, a woman now. But at 15, he started sending me messages about how, quote, hot I was. In the summer of 2017, I messaged him, telling him that I was going to see him in concert in the following months. He replied by telling me that he couldn't wait to see me. He also asked me, quote, how old are you now? I told him 15. He then told me to, quote, 
Hurry up. Not too long after that, his messages to me became blatantly sexual. Aside from Cleveland, the only other time that the defendant sexually assaulted me was in October of 2017. It happened in Illinois in the middle of the night. He digitally pen traded me in the back seat of my aunt's car while she was driving him to a friend's house. This eventually led to many months of inappropriate messages and photos being exchanged over Instagram and Snapchat. The photos exchanged included photos of my body and photos of his body and his genitals. He would tell me how badly he wanted to penetrate me vaginally. On December 1st, 2017, my aunt took me to the Odeon Concert Club to watch him perform. That night, the defendant took me backstage to be alone with him. He started kissing me and the night ended and him having me perform oral sex on him twice. The next incident happened on December 2nd, 2017. While I was alone with him in his hotel room, he had talked to me about seeing me one last time before we all left Cleveland and went home. So we went to his hotel to say goodbye. In his hotel room, he started kissing me and had me perform oral sex on him again. My aunt was right outside the room waiting in the hallway while this was happening. She trusted him and never thought that he would ever do anything to hurt me. The sexual messages continued for a while after that until I eventually put a stop to them. He ignored me for many days at first. Eventually, he tried apologizing to me for quote, breaking my heart, but deleted those messages quickly afterward. He preyed on me and abused me. He is a monster and a danger to children. Jared Drake Bell is a pedophile and that is his legacy. People picked apart Drake's body language and pointed out that he was laughing, smirking, and shocked. But nobody mentioned that a lot of what the victim was saying here were new allegations that nobody in the court ever heard before. Specifically the allegations that he forced the girl to give him oral and the allegation that he sent nude photos. The defense and the court both confirmed with evidence that no such advances were made. Otherwise, the charges would have been more severe. He did not plead to sexual misconduct or engaging in sexual relations. He pled to endangering, attempted endangering children and disseminating matter harmful to juveniles. These are serious allegations, but they do not involve sexual relations. This is what Drake's defense admits to. So the acceptance of the responsibility, Your Honor, uh, is for chats that occurred between he and the victim. The subject matter of those chats were discussion because they had known each other for years and there were claims that became sexual in nature. When asked, however, uh, at what point, uh, or at your age, excuse me, uh, at that point he said, can you hurry up? Which shows a complete intent not to engage uh, with a minor. So, however, those chats harmful as they were, clearly harmed this person uh, at that time. They were sexual in nature. Those were, yes. Thank you. They certainly, however, Your Honor, did not mimic any of the factual scenarios that the victim has brought up here today. Uh, and again, I have to emphasize the fact that once the age was known, that terminated at that point, saying hurry up uh, with the age. But I will say this, at the start, he may not have known. He did learn of the age at a later time, Your Honor, and that is why he's accepting the plea. Basically, Drake admits to conversing with a minor for years, even though he says he didn't know her age. Those conversations eventually turned sexual. Then when he asked for her age, she told him 15 and he said, hurry up, then stopped all communication. When Drake stopped conversing with her, they claimed that flipped the young girl's world upside down and she started going after Drake's wife and threatening to expose him. They basically paint her as a crazy, obsessed, and jealous fan, which we don't really know if that's true or not. We can't say the victim is lying and we don't know what evidence was found during the investigation because almost none of it was revealed to the public. But we do know she was bringing up new allegations in her impact statement that she did not formally bring up during the 18 month investigation. Therefore, they cannot be legally considered during sentencing. It's up for you to decide if she was just an obsessed fan that was jealous and trying to ruin his reputation or if she is actually a victim of a corrupt legal system. Bell was sentenced to two years probation, 200 hours of community service in California, and cannot have any contact with the victim. He was not required to register as a sex offender. At the time, the public looked at Drake as a pedophile who got off with a slap on the wrist. Drake tried countless times to proclaim his innocence, but it didn't work. They claimed he fled to Mexico to avoid punishment when we established before that his career had always thrived in Mexico. Shortly after the sentencing, Josh Peck went on multiple 
podcast claiming that him and Drake were never friends, and that they didn't really know each other off set, they were just co-workers who went their separate ways. And when I did my own research into the story, it seemed like a bold-faced lie and Josh was trying to separate himself from Drake to avoid backlash. From there, Drake's life began spiraling out of control. On December 7th, 2022, eyewitnesses caught Drake in the driver's seat of his car inhaling a substance out of balloons while his toddler son and wife were in the back seat. The very next day, another eyewitness report captured him outside of a vape shop inhaling a blue balloon with his child in the back seat. At the time, Bell was still on probation for attempted child endangerment and was seemingly engaging in a recreational substance known as whippets, where people inhale nitrous oxide from balloons, causing them to experience euphoria, hallucinogenic states, and relaxation. This drug is also extremely addictive and dangerous. The weird behavior continued on April 13th, 2023 when the Daytona Beach Police Department listed Drake Bell as missing and said he had been last seen before 9 p.m. on April 12th in the area of Mainland High School. The department's post noted what car Drake was likely driving, a 2022 gray BMW, and said he could be considered missing and endangered. TMZ obtained a 911 call where someone from Orlando PD explained why police were deeply concerned for Bell's well-being. Basically, there is uh, a celebrity who had a falling out with his wife. We got involved because the, the family, he's been texting the family in California saying that he's going to get drunk and himself and he's in a hotel somewhere in Orlando. Drake tweeted shortly after he was seemingly located, you leave your phone in the car and don't answer for a night and this? While Drake seemed fine given the circumstances, the following week his wife filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. Per the petition, Janet asked for legal and physical custody of their son Jeremy, with Bell getting visitation rights. She also sought spousal support. Bell later revealed that he found out my wife filed for divorce from TMZ before promoting his new song, going away. In the song, Drake ironically sings about moving away to a remote island with his wife and son and starting a new life. Presumably unable to cope with the stress of losing his wife and child, eyewitnesses caught Drake using whippets once again on April 25th as he inhaled from a fully inflated balloon, merely days after the media publicized his divorce. When paparazzi asked him about it, this was his response. There's some photos that surfaced of you with red balloons. What do you think, what do you gotta say about that, those balloons? Uh, you know, it is what it is. We'll figure it out. But everything's good? Yeah, everything's fantastic, man. Drake Bell was at the lowest point of his life. Drugs had taken over and he had nowhere left to turn but rehab. However, rehab changed his life more than he anticipated as he began to open up about his childhood abuse. But when I got into rehab, it was a really intense facility. Um, and I went through a lot of grief counseling and trauma therapy and group therapy and one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it was all day. And I was unearthing all of these things that I never talked about, not only never talked about with strangers, but even with people I was close to had never gotten that deep about things that I've experienced and things that have happened. And, and I was around so many people who for the first time had similar stories or incredible trauma in their lives and were opening up and sharing. And, and that was the first time that I really was felt like I was in an environment that was comfortable enough to share and felt comfortable enough around people that weren't gonna judge and that really just wanted to see you get better. Shortly after he got out of rehab, he was approached again by the producers of the Quiet On Set documentary and he decided to share his story with the world. After hearing about Drake's abuse, the public did a 180 shift on him. His comment sections went from calling him a pedophile to sharing love, condolences, and positivity. People all of a sudden were empathetic. Some even used his past as an excuse for him allegedly engaging in inappropriate behavior with minors. They said things like Bell was a part of the cycle of abuse and couldn't control what was happening to him. It's true that childhood abuse can have profound psychological effects on survivors, including trauma, depression, and PTSD. Children who grow up suffering abuse may learn abusive behavior as a means of coping or as a model for how relationships function. Approximately one-third of all individuals who are abused in childhood will become abusers themselves, according to a study funded by the National Institute of Justice. A survivor of childhood sexual abuse may try to undo that abuse by taking back power. Someone who has been abused can play the role of the more powerful person in the relationship in an attempt to overcome the powerlessness they felt. One day after the Quiet On Set documentary released, Drake released a song and music video called I Kind Of Relate. The song starts off with the lyrics, I found beauty in my pain, I'm running away, from the 
abuse and all the shame, cause no one comes to my house anymore, no one knocks on my door. These lyrics are complemented with a visual of him as a child entering his on-set trailer with a grown man who likely represents Brian Peck, his abuser. Then the track quickly transitions to his infamous 2006 car crash, where 19 year old Drake Bell was stopped at a red light and a driver fell asleep at the wheel going 60 miles per hour, then crashed into his 1966 Mustang head on. Bell broke his jaw in three places, fractured his neck, and lost a bunch of teeth. The song continues, I lost my path so long ago, in 2008 I found love in Mexico, cause no one wants to hear me in the states, so I'm running away. However, Bell releasing this music video after the documentary made some people think he was being disingenuous, that he was essentially capitalizing off the publicity to sell a record. Others pointed out that he has been writing about the abuse in his music for years, like in his 2006 song, In the End, where he wrote, The monsters in your head have left you all to yourself. It's alright if ugly little things remind you of how it felt. Another day no one tells you what it means, what's in your way and poisoning your dreams, the darkest place that you've ever been. Or in his 2020 track, What is Wrong? Well I wish I was a kid again, I would laugh and play, like we did back then. Would I be afraid of all the monsters who just left me here in these abandoned rooms? We all know that artists write music based on their real life experiences, and this is Drake Bell's story to tell. Did he pre-plan this song and video to drop at the same time this documentary came out for strategic business purposes? He absolutely did. But it's pretty safe to assume that Drake would 100 out of 100 times choose to not have experienced this horrific trauma. He would have rather had a normal childhood. And if the tiny benefit is that he can make a song about his pain, then so be it. You could also argue that all the people who didn't want to hear his story until he came out about his own abuse are more disingenuous. Plus the people that made the documentary are profiting off his story. Every YouTuber and TikToker and Twitch streamer talking about it are making money from it. That does not diminish or devalue the seriousness of his experience. From there, enraged fans began attacking his co-star Josh Peck, bombarding his comment section with hate, calling him an accomplice and placing blame on him for Drake's abuse. They just somehow believed that Josh was complicit or aware of Drake's situation. Josh did make a statement on Instagram that he reached out to Drake privately and showed his support for the survivors that spoke out. Drake even asked supporters to take it easy on Josh. But he has reached out to, uh, uh, to talk with me and, and help me work through this. And and uh, has been really, really great. So I uh, just wanted to let you guys know that and to uh, take it a little easy on him. Drake asking people to give Josh grace is especially profound considering Josh threw him under the bus when Drake's allegations came to light. But Josh wasn't the only one receiving attacks. Fans went as far as attacking both of Drake's previous accusers, sending them threats and claiming that they were liars trying to use Bell for publicity. After Quiet on set, many diehard Drake Bell fans seem to think that he is 100% innocent, but the reality is that two things can be true at the same time. Drake can be a victim and a predator. It's okay to be empathetic and understanding towards Drake the child while also holding Drake the adult accountable for previous actions. Understanding all the context in this type of situation is important to prevent it from happening again. Nothing is ever black and white in this world, so you have to use all of this information given in the video to determine who you think Drake Bell truly is.